Good afternoon, and welcome to the JCR circle of today. We are studying a judicial conflict resolution, and within the semester, we have various presentations that relate to, let's say, a social psychology aspects of judges' activity. Our basic effort is to understand the settlement phenomena and the role of judges in promoting settlement. And I think today we have a very unique opportunity to think about this problem from the perspective of the behavioral law and economics and combining moral aspects, legal aspects, uh, a big project that uh, our guest uh, developed. And I think uh, during this uh, semester, we approach the phenomena of judicial work from perspectives that are external to the legal field. The last conference was on legal formalism, but still we spoke about ODR and other elements of uh, analyzing what uh, judges do. And part of the, of the challenge that we have in this research is to really work together in an interdisciplinary mode to understand how to improve judges' work of settlement and how to help the system in general to deal with, with legal conflicts. So I think Yuval deals with it more <laughs> from the perspective of uh, regulation and less from the perspective of the post-fact uh, 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 work of the judge. But uh, his work really stimulates thinking about the possibilities that are offered by this kind of science that speak about the rationality of people and the way they deal with uh, social conflicts. So we, we have uh, with us today Professor Yuval Feldman from the Faculty of Law at bar University, a colleague and a friend. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading the, the chapter that he sent and learned about, a lot about his uh, study. And uh, it's really a shame that this was the opportunity to learn what he's doing, because it's a very ambitious project that deals with kind of managing uh, the legal system in a different way to speak about the law of good people. And, uh, and, on we'll, and we'll get to the presentation uh, itself. And I think these kinds of projects are projects that are supposed to change the way law looks like. In that sense, we would really like to take the same kind of uh, train and to, to ride the same uh, path and to think how your, your work can relate to our idea of to, to, to change the way we think about a legal reality and uh, in a sense it helps us to complicate things in a way that will help us uh, disentangle them and resolve it again in our own uh, uh, small context of, of the research. So just according to our tradition, uh, we'll start with introducing the people around the table and, uh, and then uh, we'll let uh, Yuval begin and uh, I will uh, respond. So I'm Michal Alperstein, I'm the primary investigator of this project of ERC, Judicial Conflict Resolution, and I'm really happy to continue this tradition of the circles. <laughs> Nori Zimmerman, the project director. I'm Dr. Edith Rovel, I'm a research fellow, and I'm our coordinator in the room soon. Sarah Kanel, the manager of the CLIM. Ayelet Sela, I'm the social legal researcher for the year. Doctor. Doctor. Sivan Shalom, a faculty member here at Doctor. I was a lay judge in the Haifa District Court for uh, uh, six years, and I'm um, yet to be decided to vote my part in all this project. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Daniela Cohen, and uh, I'm a PhD student in the Haifa District Court, and I'm a PhD student. I'm Raquel Hassan, Dr. Raquel Hassan from Roma, and uh, I'm postdoctoral here. <coughs> Judge Doctor Itmai Rai and us only listen what is happening. Mm -hmm. My name is Gideon Fisher. 
and I'm a PhD student uh, with Miki, with Professor Michal Aberstein, and I'm uh, very honored uh, to be here. I'm Yohanan Zangen, I'm a student in uh, um, dispute uh, uh, resolutions, doing my masters. I'm Hanan Mandel, Dr. Hanan Mandel, uh, from Ono Academic College, and from today, special advisory for civil <laughs> procedure to the project. <laughs> okay, so we'll begin now with Yuval discussing the law of good people, challenging state ability to regulate behavior of human behavior. Yes, so I'm about to open with an apology why I have a presentation in English and I'm speaking in Hebrew, but I just learned <laughs> that I need to speak in English, so uh, it's a good thing I have this presentation in English. Uh, um, okay, so yeah, I'm kind of hoping if I write enough times that the uh, book is coming out in uh, 2017, it's going to come out because it's actually not done yet, and uh, I will kind of review this literature of behavioral ethics, part of the problem that it's... Uh, grows so quickly that it's really hard to summarize. It's like find myself taking chapters which were supposed to be done and then a new study that I said, oh, no one in literature have done that. And then all of a sudden I, I realized that actually just yesterday someone did it and I need to revise uh, the chapter. So, but I really uh, hope to be, I'm, I think I'm already in the final stages of the book. Um, so the idea of the book is, uh, I think as Mickey uh, kind of phrase it, I think it is ambitious in the sense that it tries to create a new field of behavioral analysis of law, uh, where kind of uh, um, the current uh, literature, I think the more kind of known types of literature uh, focus first on cognition, and this is the whole kind of Tversky and Kahneman project where we show that, uh, they show that people are not as smart as economists used to think, so they have a lot of systematic errors in the way they make decisions about, uh, about the future, about risk, about uh, entitlement, and so on. Um, we have another kind of uh, attack on rational choice. Um, I think maybe the scholar most associated with is, uh, I think your former advisor, Tom Tyler, uh, with all the kind of why people obey the law, so people care about fairness, not just about prices. Uh, we have a, a kind of a, a third attack on the rational choice is kind of people, are do, and it's related, but it's focusing mostly on kind of this notion of people being altruistic, cooperative, focusing on pro-social uh, behavior above and beyond what self-interest could predict. Um, we have a lot of literature. Uh, we had a conference here just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, one of the, uh, so actually were two, two or three of the kind of leading scholars in that area of the crowding out, so both... Uh, <laughs> Uri and Dave Rand were, were show kind of, uh, you cannot really assume that maybe people are not just sensitive to prices, but maybe it's kind of a safe enough approach. Uh, and people will adjust because there are a lot of damages to how people behave uh, if you treat them as if uh, they only care about prices. And in a sense, kind of the focus that uh, I think is neglected in the current legal literature, and I think uh, I would try to argue for no good reason, uh, is the notion of the kind of behavioral ethics, which is, um, I would say, a newer literature relative to behavioral ethics. Uh, and I think its relevancy to law uh, is uh, quite dramatic, and I'll at least try to convince you uh, that this is the case. And again, there are a lot of uh, uh, literatures, uh, books coming out in recent uh, years trying to show that people, in a sense, are not... Uh, maybe I said in one sentence, people's uh, bad behaviors are sometimes done without them recognizing either deliberately or not deliberately as being bad. So, and, and I will discuss some of the mechanisms, but the, the overall idea, and I think people could relate to that, we have really a hard time thinking bad things about ourselves. Uh, and it's, some of it is really without us noticing. Some of it we come up with a whole kind of uh, justification that we uh, use to explain to ourselves why is it that what we did, everyone is doing it, it's okay, it's no harm, it's, it's no, no, it's no victim, no one is being, it suffers from it, and, and so far and so on. And the, the combination of those non-deliberative processes where people have this blind spot, they don't recognize their own wrongdoing, with this more kind of deliberative uh, process to remote ourselves from anything which will harm our self-image as good people, 
um, is responsible to many of the misconducts people engage in. And it's kind of, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, the argument of the book that given this literature, if we think it's a serious one, we need to revise the law. Because if, for example, um, so if, for example, people uh, do not think that they discriminate, people do not think that what they do is, uh, is a bribe or is something which is a conflict of interest or that the, the anything that they do is really problematic, um, it's not necessarily the case that increasing the sanction will have any effect of them. So for most of the traditional legal interventions, where law said doing that and that is bad. If you do that, you're going to be punished. If you do that, all the things have to assume some kind of process where people say, oh, they're talking to me. If we have all those mechanisms that prevent us from recognizing that when they talk about how important it is not to discriminate, they also include you, it's not going to change uh, your behavior and you have to think of ways how to deal with it. And part of what I try to do is to kind of uh, think of of how kind of the law could change uh, its, uh, or what kind of functions the law could use to deal with the, uh, the good people. And I will already say, and I'll talk about it later, that uh, this does not uh, prevent us from recognizing that there are bad people out there. So even with all these behavioral ethics, and again, this is, uh, I, I, would, I think, without exaggerating thousands of papers, that uh, show various effects in how people dishonesty is affected by situational cues that they don't even recognize, it doesn't mean that there aren't out there calculative individuals who come in the morning and think, I'm about to break the law. So, which makes the challenge even greater because it's not just that we need to build a law which will kind of deal with those, uh, I call them in the book, the situational wrongdoers. So those who do not plan to do wrong, but in given situation, they do things which end up being bad without them, again, kind of deliberating about doing them, we still have those bad people and we somehow need to come up with a way to deal with those two populations, which is very hard to <coughs> kind of differentiate between them ex ante and, and uh, again, they're not even stable. So it's not that you know, someone who is kind of in this situational wrongdoer, the good people camp stays there across all behaviors. Many of the people shift and change. And so the challenge is is really, uh, I think, dramatic. But again, I don't think I have all the solutions uh, in the book, but I'm trying at least to outline the problem. What do we have now? What do we know? And how should we move uh, forward? So just kind of a few examples for the behavioral uh, ethics. So again, the blind spot, a, a very kind of elaborated uh, paradigm which shows kind of how people really cannot see their own wrongdoing. So this notion that people have this uh, blind spot that are very good to recognize it when others are doing it, are not very good when they themselves do it. And you can even, and I think, again, not being without doing any experiment, just kind of by talking to people. You see it all the time where someone who you recognize uh, doing something very corrupt, uh, which is kind of one of the areas that focus more in my own kind of this whole notion of implicit corruption. Uh, someone who will do corrupt things will kind of say, oh, I can't stand those people who are doing all those bad things and they're helping their friends and they make, I mean, doing all kinds of things, but they are, have very hard time recognizing that something is related uh, to them. And, and you see a lot of uh, situations uh, like that. Moral forgetting is another kind of interesting paradigm which uh, kind of documents how people forget, n genuinely forget, no say, oh, I didn't know, <laughs> really forget things which put them in a bad, uh, in a kind of, uh, or make it hard for them to think of themselves nicely. So if you kind of give people all kind of games, they play, and then you try, you basically show that even using all kind of physiological tests, they actually forget the things that uh, they kind of, uh, might uh, in increase their guilt. So it's kind of a, me a defense mechanism people use to remove themselves from their own uh, wrongdoing. Moral licensing, moral licensing is another uh, interesting paradigm where people uh, who do uh, one, for example, one good thing, uh, for example, you give them an opportunity to discriminate in one situation, uh, let's say a legal case where they need to have a white and a black defendant and people who kind of 
uh, where you know you give them more evidence against the, the white defendant, and they end up saying, you know, he is the guy who should be uh, convicted if you have like two suspects or something. And then uh, you give them an opportunity to hire people. You see that those people who had the opportunity to do something good will end up um, be becoming more uh, discriminatory in their second kind of in their second uh, option uh, or second trial. So the fact that I have this kind of uh, perspective, oh, I'm not. A discriminatory guy because I had this opportunity to suspect the black guy and I suspected the, the, the white guy it means that I have this moral licensing now to do a bad thing so obviously this is not a deliberative process people don't know that this is happening but because we have all kind of this balance of how we view ourselves uh, really really nice findings in that direction the whole notion of embodiment uh, is uh, uh, really uh, interesting. So you have all kind of uh, studies showing, for example, people are more likely to cheat in the afternoon relative to the morning. They're more likely to cheat when it's warm. They're more likely to cheat if the color of the walls is different. Uh, they're less likely to cheat if there is a, a teddy bear. They're less likely to cheat if there is childhood, childhood mu uh, kind of uh, music. Uh, Who cheats more, men or women? Um, <laughs> I think there is research on that. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I've seen both ways studies on that, but I'm not Good sure. He's what? Good because he's a man. No, no, I, I try to remember kind of sense. I think that it's... it's morning, something. it's landing. Yeah. Um, actually, so just for example, there was someone who kind of challenged this. This was like a nature paper, I think. And someone says, I, I, this cannot happen. I'm such a kind of, uh, uh, I'm in the morning, I'm awful. I can't think of anything. It cannot be. And they come up with an interaction. So it actually depends. So the, apparently, now there is a revised version that some people cheat more in the afternoon, <laughs> and some people cheat more in the morning. Uh, you probably know, and although this study was, uh, uh, I think if you are a justice, the judge here will be upset by it. You probably know about the notion of the hungry judges, yeah. uh, the, the PNAS paper. That uh, again, uh, uh, Karen um, uh, Weinshall Margal challenged that by saying that they kind of didn't control for presentation. But at least from the theory perspective, they, this is the same idea of embodiment. So the notion that when the uh, glucose level in your blood is lower, uh, your kind of system uh, system two, your more kind of deliberate uh, um, deliberate system of decision making is is it's more depleted. So you, you're less less likely to use self control. And you're more likely to rely on heuristics and your system, your intuition, which have all those. So I think the theory is good. And then some other glucose studies about ethicality, although this specific uh, uh, study was challenged, although I think they have a response to the response to argue that okay. even that, I mean, I don't know where it stands now. But uh, actually, I have to say, I really like that paper. Uh, I was <laughs> upset when it was uh, uh, challenged. Um, <laughs> So again, another kind of, uh, um, I think, major finding of this literature suggests that, uh, I'm, I'm, you're familiar with the system one, system two, I'm kind of... Uh, Let's take a Kahneman system. Yes, um, so the, the system one, system two is, again, it's Kahneman, again, used it more for, in the context of cognitive biases and heuristics, but this notion, that it's not really a, 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 a kind of a accurate representation of the brain, but it's, I think it helps to have this idea that we have the more deliberate, kind of slower, which is kind of, we are aware of the kind of the thinking process, which is called system two. And in a sense, this is for most of what the law cares about is usually system two. So this is kind of these uh, uh, processes where we know what we want to do, we think about it, we do kind of, uh, for, you know, all kind of uh, uh, tricks people use to make the decision. And the, kind of the system one is the, the more intuitive, the faster, uh, you're not aware to most of the things that uh, it does, and the argument is actually responsible for most of our decisions. So, and again, this is the whole idea that we don't really know ourselves. And one of the, I think, the uh, major um, findings of psychology ever is this how bad people are in understanding who they are and even explaining why is it that they even make any decision. So, you mentioned your study where people want to, uh, you want to understand how people make decisions. Psychology will be very skeptical about people's ability to kind of reflect on why is it that they got married. Because the decision to some extent could have been without them noticing. And what happened, like Jonathan Hyde is a famous psychologist, this is kind of one of his major arguments that most of what 
system two is doing is kind of uh, reflect on decision we already made and just we come up with why is it that we did it, we did it but it's not actually the, the real process. We just, this is just the, the stage where it kind of it serves to the kind of the, our, our conscious uh, reasoning. Um, so in the context of behavioral ethics, most researchers, some dis disputed, most researchers suggest the more time that you have to make a decision, you're more likely to be honest. So the less time that you have, you are more likely to cheat. Um, and this is really, again, the, again, one of the kind of the ways to kind of differentiate system one and system two, this is how much time you have. There is, um, I think it's not really an opposing way, but Rand, who was also in the conference on non-deliberative choice, which was here in Barland two weeks ago, he has a whole uh, line of research, and, and also Green from Harvard uh, Psychology. Uh, this suggests almost, so it's not the opposite, but a different view, which uh, might be also interesting to your line of work, that people who have less time are more cooperative. Okay, so it's not, so, so this is again about women. No, I just was thinking about uh, tendency to collaborate. So uh, uh, again, the idea is that in all less kind of cooperation less games, time. No. less time, yes. So people's yes. intuition is more cooperative. When they have more time, they become more strategic and try to think of all kind of, uh, uh, of things. And you have all kind of uh, uh, studies, just a, a, one nice study he mentioned in the conference, so it's in Regent's Park in London, and someone is, um, uh, someone is um, losing his hat or something, or a scarf, and then they kind of, uh, oper they kind of randomized how far away were the pedestrian, like this, just someone who walks there from the event. And the less time he had, he was more likely to help. Um, so again, so it was like a, a, a research assistant was playing a guy who lost something, and they kind of they randomized the, 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 le the uh, distance from the person they were studying, these just kind of normal people walking in Regent's Park, and just uh, to show that the more time you have, should I help him or not, it's kind of people develop this notion that they're not helping. So this is, again, an important line of research within it that tries to understand, you know, what's the true nature of people, you know. Th again, it's related to a lot of even philosophical debates of what's people's kind of true nature. Um, uh, another kind of important thing is the notion of the situation. And again, social psychology talks for, for um, over 100 years now about the situation matter. But I think what behavioral ethics argue that it matters in many more ways than you ever even imagined. So really, uh, you know, original social psychology was like, you know, a situation with someone in a white coat telling you to, uh, you know, you know, electro, you know, put like electrical shock to someone or, uh, you know, a Zimbardo Stanford prison experiment where someone, you, you give you the, the opportunity to hit people and then you become sadistic. So the really extreme situation. The behavioral ethics, that I think they're a kind of unique contribution um, in terms of from the perspective of law that really small changes in the situation could make a huge difference in the likelihood that you will do a good or a bad thing. And, and again, this requires us to think about questions of people's responsibility, about people's uh, awareness, about people's ability to change. Because again, it's not someone who uh, wake up in the morning and say, I'm about to discriminate and, and just let's find a good way to do it. I'm about to do something which is illegal, but you come up with no kind of, you know, pre-planned ideas, but a given situation depends on how many people are in the room. Uh, for example, they have a nice study that in this literature that people who work together are more likely to cheat just because we're doing it in pairs. So this, for example, challenged the whole 4 I principle which we would, one would think that if you are on your own, you will do, but actually it's the other way around. I was telling uh, uh, Gidon before about this all kind of studies that people will do worse things for others. <laughs> so one rational choice would predict that if you take more of the money to yourself, you're more likely um, to do bad things for it, but it's actually the less you get from the money, you're more likely. Because again, this is, it gives you this, uh, uh, this opportunity to feel good about yourself and still uh, you get something from it, but you don't feel as uh, corrupt. Uh, maybe one last example that uh, I will uh, suggest in this kind of tradition is the notion of half lies, which I think also kind of uh, makes the argument about behavioral ethics. 
So, um, you know, people have a dice and they are, um, they, no one see uh, what they do. Uh, so, they, you know, they get into some, I don't know, some uh, sh um, shed or some, something where no one can see what they do. They uh, throw a, a, a dice and then um, they, they are told that if they say one, they get two euros, two, four euros, three, six euros, five, they get 10 euros. If they have six, they get nothing. Okay, so what do you think, like if you have a thousand people, what do you think is the distribution? What they say? Uh, three, oh. four, and five goes. Uh, three, four, and five will be yeah. the most common? Yeah. No, most like, let's ask it differently. <laughs> if people are rational, what should be the number reported? Seven. Five. Five, right? Because no one can tell if you're lying or not, and you get, you know, you maximize your benefit. Right. If everyone is honest, what should be the distribution? <laughs> 20% uh, of each. Uh, 16, right? 16 right. So again, like equal distribution. Right. What happened is really like three, a normal five. curve around three. Three, four, five. Um, and <laughs> yeah. So again, if you think about it, this is exactly kind of this notion they of are the. They lying, but they are not lying as much as. Five. Right. They, so they, they have this ability to tell themselves, I could have, I could have. Light more, I'm not, so this is kind of this ethical dissonance. So I'm Relatively, I'm a good guy. Right, I'm maximizing my self interest, but still allowing myself a way not to. Like Edom. Good. Edom go fine. <laughs> uh, fine. So, just to. Uh, um, um, I did it in, in, in Israel, I was interested in something similar. So, I heard this was done in Germany, and I did it in Israel, and I was trying to figure out what will happen if uh, half of the, of the sample will be given a coin. So they get all the money if they have um, tail and nothing. Because I thought maybe here in the dice you have six options, people could move. But in a coin you're either dishonest or not. So I was wondering whether we will see everyone becoming honest because they don't have it. Um, and so I couldn't find any significant difference, but the interesting thing was that in Israel the distribution was around four. So it was a kind of, uh, so people pushed a bit this... Uh, one of five, right. one of three. You're right. Lie more. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, this is kind of, uh, so this is the, the literature that is kind of the basis uh, of the book. And, and, and again, just to kind of main, make it in a more kind of general terms, uh, I think part of the reason why such literature did not uh, didn't get to the main legal scholarship is related to how law and psychology developed. So, you know, law and psychology was traditionally focusing on like child custody and uh, insanity defense and really kind of ext not extreme population, but I would say mo <coughs> population which are not about normative people. So kind of the behavior of ordinary people was never part of law and psychology. Then came Tversky and Kahneman who were psychologists but published in economics, created this field of behavioral economics, and then because law and economics was a very successful kind of endeavor, endeavor within law, the legal scholarship, psychology got through economics to law, which I think influenced the way psychology is affecting law even today. So only things that economists care about, lawyers care about. And to some extent, part of what I'm trying to argue in the book is that we should break this kind of communication through economics. So there's so much to psychology which economists do not care about, such as behavioral ethics, but law should really care a lot about because law is all about you know, morality and responsibility and people have awareness to their wrongdoing. It, it's true that from an economic perspective, things about risk and probabilities are more important, but um, it's not really clear why the law should follow and not develop its own kind of interaction with uh, psychology. So just an, an example, is if you think about this whole notion, again, I think it's highly related to your project, um, the notion that people are exaggerating their chances of winning. So this is, again, one of the kind of uh, a classical study that suggests that because of self-serving biases, people thought, think that their chances in an appeal or are, are greater than they are. So this is kind of why there is a problem to, to create some sort of uh, a, a mediation or, or kind of agreeing outside of court because people um, are too optimistic about the chances. But if you think about it from uh, the broader psychological literature, self-serving uh, and disputes, it's not just about probability of winning. It's about people don't even recognizing why is it anyone sues them. I mean, they, I didn't do anything wrong. I know I'm, I'm such a good person. I'm such an honest, and you see, you, I mean, I'm really, and it's not, I'm not doing any qualitative work, but I am talking to people and, you know, kind of listening to that. And this phrase, I'm such an honest person, 
I don't know. I mean, it's something people always say about themselves, and I think, to 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 much greater extent, self-serving biases explain disputes not because probabilities of people kind of exaggerating the chance of winning. It's because they don't think they did anything wrong, because they interpret what they did in a, in a, in a much favorable way, which makes it very hard for them authentically. Not that they make it up. They just think, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm really a good person. Why is it that anyone is, is going after me? And, 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 and we have kind of other biases which are, um, steadily enough, cause us to view others as being worse than they really are. Uh, which, you know, this combination, I think, is responsible for many of the disputes, not just, I'm not saying it's not correct, but I think it's a bit kind of marginal. Um, so is it about oneself or about how he, the others? You mean this gap? Yeah. Um, um, I think the literature overall suggests it's more <coughs> about the self. So we're actually pretty good. Um, so there is this one study that I remember about in, uh, kind of people who didn't predict the likelihood that people will engage in pro-social activities. People were very accurate about others and very bad about themselves. Um, but there are other paradigms where we kind of tend to remember only the bad things others were doing. So you know, we, we need to kind of, kind of characterize people, we, again, due to various cognitive reasons, the bad things they did are more likely to be memorable. And so sometimes we have this kind of uh, more kind of uh, a sad image of others. I actually tried in, in a one study to term a, a bias that didn't work. I mean, no one, I mean, almost no one did. It's called pessimism bias. Uh, we tried that to kind of show how people are pessimistic about the character of others. Um, and we, we kind of reviewed the literature to explain why is it. Uh, but uh, so I, I think there is something like that. But overall, I think people. Uh, and you see it even in surveys the attribution that fallacy, uh, fundamental attribution error. <laughs> uh, it is related. Yeah, I could explain some of it. But I think generally the argument in surveys is that it's better sometimes to ask people to evaluate how like a typical person would behave. People would actually be more accurate than asking about your own behavior, where you have all those mechanisms that prevent Especially you. In Israel. in Israel, if you ask somebody, what would you do? You would think what you're expecting. To answer, right. but if you ask him what would your friends do, then he says freely what he thinks he would. Right. Do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's called like descriptive norm and injunctive norm. I think that's the. Um, so um, part of what uh, I think needed in such a, a new behavioral perspective is really to account for the differences between people. I mentioned kind of this intentional versus situational and uh, focusing on various kind of individual difference uh, uh, arguments so this you know, the whole personality, there's a, a long list of uh, scales which could explain why some people are more likely to, uh, to do uh, bad things even automatically. So it's not that you know, everyone is the same. And a again, I speak a lot in, in different audiences uh, about like uh, implicit corruption and people always say, oh, so what would you say about Benny Biegi? Okay, Today so they ask you what do you say about the current? Uh, <laughs> no, no, Benny Begin, not Benny Begin, Benny Begin. So, part of the arguments that behavioral ethics argue that, and, and I see that in many of the studies, that you don't need a lot to corrupt people. So, people would do, uh, for not so much money, you will see people cheat. I mean, the percentages, like in dishonesty studies, it's sometimes 40, 50 percent, 60, I mean, it's substantial amounts of the subject. Uh, do uh, lie, and then people come up and say, oh, so what do you say about this, whatever, honest politician? So if everyone in a given situation where, I don't know, politicians need money to get elected, whatever, how come there are all those politicians, which at least we have the image of them, you know, not being part of this process, and, and, I, and I think it's true. I mean, there, there are individual differences, so even with this uh, focus on the power of the situation, it does not mean that everyone is affected in a similar way, which again creates a greater challenge. How do we differentiate? How do we come up with policies that we deal with um, all those processes? Uh, another kind of uh, literature which again makes this whole um, uh, behavioral ethics and the love of good people more relevant, not just being a theory, uh, is this notion of behavioral insight teams. <coughs> uh, so I don't know how much you know about this movement. We have, I think, in, I think uh, so it's 28, I think. Uh, and just today, uh, there was a, an earlier conference of uh, Tzili about gender. Um, there was, a, a, I forgot her name, from Miranda from Australia, who is involved with the Australian behavioral insight team. So the idea is that 
you use psychology and behavioral economics to improve the work of the government. Uh, this is like, it started in the UK. Uh, they have the largest and more, more elaborated uh, elaborative kind of unit. I think they have, uh, I've been there a few weeks ago, they have like close to 100 researchers working on numerous projects for the government where they try to make uh, regulation more effective, to increase trust, to cause people to save energy, to uh, consume less, to think more about their uh, future, to pre you know, prevent people from doing all kind of harmful behavior. So this is a huge thing and related to this uh, uh, word that I uh, uh, I think I have the, this, the nudge, right? So uh, again, in the U.S., there is a Carl Sunstein, who is uh, uh, now is a Harvard Law professor. He was, I think, he was the lecturer of Barack Obama. So when he, in the first Obama administration, he picked him to be the head of uh, OISHA or OIRA or I think OIRA, the office of. Uh, it's kind of the. He was called, and it was the, the regulation czar. And he kind of was the person who pushed uh, the notion of governments could use all kind of nudges, such as default rules, framing, um, you know, changing all kind of uh, the order in the cafeteria, causing you to eat healthier, changing the size of the plates, um, making all kind of small tweaks in the situation, changing people's behavior. So this is really engaging with this whole dual reasoning. So because people system one is so dominant, you don't need to convince them to do good things or, or to, to save and all that. You just need to change stuff. And this was actually debated. I'm sorry. It's it, it's really it's problematic in a sense. It's like really like. It's you like the big brother. Yeah, it's like manipulation. It sounds like technicalities, but it actually like to play with people's mind in a sense. Uh, right. Uh, like without even them knowing that you do this while they are eating in the cafeteria. Yeah, everyone so, is doing it. Right. Yeah. right. So, so the whole point there, though, is that people don't care as much about things that we believe are actual moral yeah, but it's choices. Kind of like with, to with organ them. donation, which you would believe is something that is super. It has to do a lot of no, I'm not saying that there are also good side, good things about it, but it's like it's people don't really know that Constantine was I don't know <laughs> nominated to somehow like control. Them. Right. So so few Basic things. Choices. Few things. One of the, one argument is that they are, the government is the second mover, so the corporation is already playing with your mind, yeah. and. <laughs> the, one would argue, and this is disputable, that gov you should trust governments more, more than, than corporations. Some people no. would argue with that. <laughs> but uh, this is like uh, uh, one thing. Another thing is that uh, like we have, I have a PhD student, uh, I mean, it's actually, it's not mine, I'm kind of in a committee that supervises work, he's in a business school here, that tries to examine what will happen to nudges if we announce them. So if we actually either make a public di discourse and say, oh, we are about to do that nu this nudge, or um, even before, you're about to be nudged. Also about, about corporation, as a consumer, I have this tendency to believe that the corporation, first and, for all, uh, first and foremost, really um, push it in, in, in the direction of its own interest. I would expect the government to maybe react different, differently, but then if the government starts operating the same way as cooperation works, so then maybe my assumption as a consumer, as a human, as a human being, should be different. Mm -hmm. But as a consumer or as a person, I'm just not being like, I just don't know about that. So. Right. And another thing, and again, with all this, and, and, and I'm, I am actually, I'm trying to have one in Israel, uh, working with the Prime Minister office to establish a BAT in Israel. So I, I'm a fan. But um, <laughs> it needs to be admitted. So, for example, you, one of you mentioned the organ donation. Yeah. So it's a famous science paper that shows kind of the uh, number of people who hold those, like, like we have in Israel, the Eddie card. In, a, in a countries where you have this default, uh, you either opt in or opt out and all that. Um, <coughs> there are some studies that suggest that in the end of the day, it's not as dramatic as you, it looks. So at the end of the day, whether you have this card or not, the family... Uh, you know, deliberate uh, in a given context, and then values are far more important than nudges on those defaults in determining whether people will donate or not. So, and, and or another kind of famous nudge which uh, was celebrated was kind of the save more tomorrow. So the idea was no one, people, not, not every, some people, especially kind of more kind of low income uh, people do not save as much on the future. They can't really, you know, for various reasons, they'll for fear as a 
uh, a psychologist from Princeton, it's a whole kind of paradigm of how poor people are not thinking uh, properly about risk, future, and so on. And they came up with uh, to a scholar named uh, Shlomo, I think Shlomo Benazzi or uh, from UCLA, they save more tomorrow. So the idea is you sign your next raise, 10% uh, of it is going to go to saving, to long-term saving. Great idea because people don't even think about the next raise and so this is, it was a good way and everyone celebrate and many, many people enrolled in it. And there are, there was a recent Harvard Law Review paper that kind of went after data showed that it's actually harmed the amount of low kind of uh, long-term saving because people relying on that save more tomorrow stop caring, you know, the sale, again, this, this government is taking care of me, they're nudging me in ways I don't even recognize, so at the end of the day, it was not as good. So this whole kind of behavioral insight team, I think, do a lot of good things. I think in the UK, they publish, they, they, they save the governments hundreds of millions of pounds a year with all kind of uh, uh, ideas. Um, but we also need to kind of recognize the limits of those uh, uh, ideas are just, uh, I think, p part of the things we need to ask if we're focusing on ethics, not just on kind of cognitive limitations, is how good it is to actually use nudges when we speak about ethicality. So, for example, the most famous ethical nudge um, is the, the sign first. So, it's again, I think it's a PNAS paper um, that show that people who are, you know, you get a, a form and you either sign at the end as the traditional way or in this uh, kind of experiment they signed in the beginning. And they showed that signing first increased their ethicality dramatically. Can you explain? After so there is a form. It up, first you right, sign. first you sign your name and then you yeah, fill the form mm -hmm. rather than the traditional where you first fill the form and then sign. Oh, okay? okay. So, so the responses were more ethical. People sense. cheated less. When okay. they signed first. Mm. Right. So great, right? Why not adopt it? And and I was a, a part of a, it was a kind of a team that was supposed to do something with the federal government. And I thought, you know, this is not a really to the, thank you. It's not a really uh, good idea because I think it works only because it surprises you. Like if this is going to become the norm, where everyone is going to, I mean, the whole idea is that you used to sign your name and you don't care. care. You see a form with your name, okay, there's something you hear, so you kind of become more aware. So if you're more aware, according to the theory we suggested before that system one is more likely to cause you to be honest, if I sign first, I am more reflecting, more deliberative, so I cheat less. But if it, this becomes the norm, so if the idea was to enact it as the whole federal government having those sign first and then fill the form, question is if it's gonna work or it's gonna kind of uh, dilute. And I think the authors were honest enough to mention, uh, I didn't, first I didn't read it, when I mentioned this criticism, someone told me they already they wrote it that I'm not sure if the kind of the um, durability of those effects, which again is a, a big problem with many of those nudges, is their work in an experiment, their work for some times, there's not enough evidence for them really changing in a sustainable, like if you care about sustainable change in society, which is what I think you should care about, not about you know causing uh, people to do something only in the short term, um, then it's not really clear uh, if it's going to work. Another thing, important uh, thing to consider is how much could you take from this whole dishonesty research and take it to law? So, for example, is there a parallel between people who cheat and people who do not comply? Um, I think there are many, many differences so, uh, uh, between them. Or if you think about it, compliance is not always dichotomous. Uh, um, I think I'll, if I have time, I'll mention some of, of my studies that, that people sometimes don't say I'm about to uh, engage in breaking the law, I'm kind of interpreting the law in a way which uh, helps uh, which helps me. And so in many, many cases, people, even if they break the law, they don't view themselves as breaking the law in contrast to some of the dishonesty um, studies. Um, yeah, didn't have sex with this <laughs> <laughs> What? You didn't pay taxes, like in tax evasion. Right, right. Um, tax planning. So, um, again, another, I think, uh, important thing to consider is taking a literature which was developed in business and management about organization and what organizations can do and kind of, you know, moving it to states. Not really clear. I mean, states have more power. Uh, states should care also about the process, not just about the outcomes. So organization, from their perspective, if we cause uh, 
reduce theft from the workplace. This is great, so we can use all kind of nudges and tweaks in the situation and get to this desirable situation. Maybe uh, states should care also about virtue, about people recognizing why am I doing a good thing, why am I doing a bad thing. Um, it's not even clear, for example, that states could ignore uh, percentages. So we, they, again, in the behavioral ethics, they talk a lot about, uh, you know, we are, these mechanisms are good for 80% of people, maybe it's enough. Because, you know, the idea is that you, it, you can't really catch everyone and it will be more effective if you just try to maximize something that you care about. Um, from a state perspective, maybe, you know, even few people who are kind of bad people uh, are... Um, are, we, we care about, we, we want to know about them, we want to kind of tag them, we want to, it's not just about some, some sort of uh, outcome perspective where we want to succeed 80% or 70% of the, of the time. Um, maybe, for example, some of the literature would suggest that organizations should be liable for creating situation in which people were more or less likely to cheat. So if we know so much about the effect of the situation, maybe the idea that should be that organization will be uh, obliged, it could be even penalized if they do not do all those things which will prevent uh, a situation where people could do more bad, bad, bad things, find excuses or justification <coughs> to do bad things and kind of shift the responsibility to some extent from the individual to the organization for not engaging in designing the situation in a way which will reduce unethicality. Um, just to just kind of fewer uh, examples. Five minutes. Uh, okay, I'm like slide seven out of 20. Uh, okay, so I'll maybe just mention, so again, a lot of literature about individual differences, and I mentioned it before, moral identity, uh, honest and humility, this is kind of a uh, uh, very important one. The IAT. What is honesty, humility? Um, honesty, humility is a dimension. Um, so you, you had like the introvert, extrovert, they were kind of traditional uh, dimension. This is, I think, the, most rec the fifth one and the most recent one, and it correlates with many. Uh, it's a good predictor of the chance that a given individual. Will be in, will not behave honestly and a cross situational effect. So it's not just in a given situation, but you'll see some uh, cross situational consistency about people who are high on those scale. Um, and, and there are many, many there are all kind of uh, of studies that try to differentiate people. Uh, in the chapter that I focus on individual differences, my overall conclusion that for the most part, it's not much you could do with it. So I actually try to argue that we should focus more on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation on a given legal situation rather than try to characterize people based on their morality because many of those studies show that, okay, this is uh, explaining 8%, 10% of the behavior. You can't know it ex ante. It's very, very hard to make differentiation based on personality. Maybe in a given situation, if you know something about a group, about the personality, you could design it. But generally speaking from a uh, the regulator or state perspective ex ante rather than ex post of courts, I'm not sure how much of individual difference you could use, but I think you should know at the least the percentages. Um, this is rule conditionality, just as a recent project we, we tried to challenge the Tom Tyler uh, idea with people's ability to find excuses for doing bad things. So we, did, we tried to create a scale when we, we showed kind of there was a variation. <coughs> Interestingly enough, we did it on law students across four countries, and the more time you spend in law school, you're more likely to find excuses to do uh, bad things. Uh, <laughs> this part is actually out of the, the paper because we were asked to replicate it in a different department to see whether it was, uh, uh, you know, just the fact that you spent a few years outside of the of, you know, your youth. Uh, and we just didn't replicate this part, so this one was not published, but we did have this effect on law school, so um, you have to trust me because it's not, we were not able to publish that. Um, let me just maybe uh, try to have it, just some, some findings. Um, okay. Read yeah. the book. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this book is really a must. This is the first chapter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, okay, so this is just uh, one example. So it's a study. Um, 
conducted with uh, Doron Teichmann and Amos Shur. Uh, and just to make this point about interpretation, people were in a lab and we, we told them, you know, we are trying to help us validate uh, like a, a psychometry or a GRE. Um, and uh, you're gonna get, you have, we have hard questions and, and easy questions and we kind of get, wanna get your uh, feeling on them. And the instruction was you need to do a reasonable which in kind of is a major kind of you know, vague standard that you use in many concepts, a reasonable mixture of hard and easy questions. Okay, you get the same uh, reward or penalty for solving the question. So in a sense, your interest is to think that reasonable means fewer hard questions and more easy questions. So you get 20 questions. Um, if you interpret reasonable in a way which will mean many, many easy questions and few hard questions, you were likely to go out of the lab with more money. And we are, we, the idea was to sh focus on loss aversion and how it's affected ethicality, again, rather than the classical more kind of uh, risk analysis. And uh, what we show that, so half of the population got to the lab, they got 20 shekels, and they lost a shekel for every mistake. Half of the population got zero shekels, and they got an extra shekel for every correct answer. From a rational choice perspective, it's the same, right? If you did 10 correct, you get 10 shekels either way, right? But the process is more painful in the, in the first one, right? You get 20 shekels for every mistake, and this is like, a, in social science, it's a huge effect. So people in the loss condition, on average, did the three something hard questions out of 20. So they thought reasonable means three hard, uh, 17 easy. People in the gain condition thought reasonable meant um, seven something uh, hard questions and 13. So this is almost, not only, this is twice as, yeah, twice as many hard questions just for the, the psychological pain of losing money, although rationally there was no difference. And this again shows kind of, you know, first of all, um, it replicates the loss of version in ethical context, but more important, the power of interpretation. So again, if you ask people in, in the, even the loss condition of the game, did you, you think you kind of interpret the contract in a fair way? People more or less thought, yes, you know, this reasonable, who knows, right? Again, in the pilot, people saw 10-10, right? If you didn't have an incentive, it was oh, it kind of a, re but you have this interest, it affects your interpretation. Uh, Is it real money? I mean, one shekel was an incentive? Uh, this is very sad, how little money you need. Uh, I'm always surprised, you know, I do many of my studies on MTurk, you know, the Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, for really, not enough, Maybe you know. a cigar even. Yeah. Um, not one cigar. Uh, so, so you know, the, when they were not paid at all, they did the ten. The pilot, when they just had to evaluate. Yeah, so yeah. It said it was, they did 10? No, it, they, was, it was, uh, they, need, they so were they, asked to evaluate. No, 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 we didn't do a, you're right. The, this is... Uh, like no control for... Uh, no right, you, because we like to control for depletion or something like that. We didn't have a condition where they actually sold it and no interest because other people will not do it. But... Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, they would get the 20 shekels anyway. Right, uh, no, it was just people asked to evaluate what do you think reasonable means. Okay. Oh, um, but this was... Uh, because I, I think there's, there, there may be that thing where it's just, you know, you want to succeed or you want to feel good about yourself that you sold the right. question, but just to be competitive. Right. Um, another one, uh, another study, this was done on kind of the revolving door paradigm, so this idea that Again, in corruption context, these people in the public service already eyeing their future employer. So we had created this uh, in a lab where people came to us, they were asked to evaluate the Safra Institute, which was the uh, cor corruption lab I was in in, in, in Harvard a few years ago. Um, and um, they were asked to evaluate how good, how important it is to study ethics and, and how much they think that, you know, ethics researchers should do whatever they care and kind of things that they could really didn't know about. And we tried to, uh, and we told them, we told uh, some of them, you know, if you do, you give us answers that we like, we might hire you for an additional study. So on uh, one hand, the instruction was they had to be objective, 
But we actually told them, you know, if you say, we didn't say that explicitly, but very subtle way, you know, if you do things which will favor us, you might get additional jobs. This was like to participate in a study for additional one dollar. Again, not dramatic. Um, and you can see kind of, you know, the difference between, so for example, you have a control, no conflict of interest, is, is the group uh, which didn't get this option for additional study, and you can see that they were saying worse thing about Safra relative to the group who had this additional study. Uh, what's interesting is the red line is about this, what do you think about the scientists, which we thought to be kind of the you know, behavior which would be almost like unethically in a very exaggerated way because you were not given any information on the scientists and you just basically saying nice things for us to hire you. Uh, this was actually not significant. So people had their own limits. Um, there were, the, it wasn't effective, uh, a significant effect when it comes to evaluating how important it is to do research on, on ethics. And the, another interesting thing that, again, with all this nudge and the focus on nudge, we have seen that just giving people an, a, to read kind of a statement about uh, morality or deterrence uh, reduced their, so you see this is kind of the, uh, the, the, left, uh, the left two groups, reduced almost the, the, all of the effects of corruption. So in a sense, this is again this dual reasoning argument where being told about the, the fact that you are doing something immoral reduced most of the effect of money on behavior. And the last thing is a sad thing, which is a good, uh, maybe good place to stop, where we uh, show that if you're nice to your employees, you're more like, they're more likely to cheat. Uh, if you, you're more nice to them, uh, they think you are a better employer, they like you more, they also cheat more. Uh, and we kind of the mediation analysis, so this was, some of the studies here are actually on, uh, it's a, I didn't do it myself, I had a, um, a, a collaborator uh, who is an econometrician who did most of the work here and she, um, she, she did it on uh, S&P, uh, uh, 250 or something, really they made the major industrial companies in the US, but this is, uh, this uh, graph is from lab result, but we actually, she, she did actually the replication on an actual data, um, and it was really across few experimental studies and across this econometrician, econom econometric study, that if a ethical code used more uh, the word we, so we and Microsoft, do not do that and that versus kind of more codes that the ethical uh, or Intel employees should, shall not, more kind of formal, remote, cold, law and order perspective. Um, so people were happier in the we condition, they liked the place more, but they also, when they were giving the opportunity to cheat, they, were less ethical. they will be less ethical. Uh, so again, this is um, a thought to take about being wow, nice yeah. to. Wow, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm wow. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Yuval. This is a, a lot, and uh, I really, I can't really respond to such a, a very broad project that has so many <coughs> results and studies. And I myself need to read the book and uh, learn more. And I think we sh all should read it and and speak about the implications. I will give some comments that uh, will first deal a bit about, you know, deal with the broader cost context of what you write in re relation to the field of conflict resolution, and then we'll go straightly into the settlement uh, uh, work, and hopefully I will leave time for questions because I think it's really important. So I really like the way you, you try to uh, supplement the current uh, behavioral law and economics with a mo most kind of a broader psychological perspective because I myself coming from the field of conflict resolution I was always uh, I was always, it was always striking the fact that when you do conflict resolution social psychology and cognitive barriers are, is, are so rich and the psychological aspects of human behavior is so much complex and when you get into the law, the same, the same perspectives are actually challenging economics, which really, <coughs> for me at least, it's not the basic uh, science uh, perspective to, to view the world. So I think 
the richness in psychology is very significant for law, and it shouldn't be with this kind of uh, a kind of uh, you know uh, law and economics uh, 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 background, and uh, and 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 it brings me to another kind of very intuitive feeling, but I, I really think that it's a matter of, uh, of, of, of merging perspectives. I mean, when you look at, at human beings in your perspectives, we are, we are animals that are affected by various uh, causes and, and, and variables, and, and in a sense, most uh, of the experiments are, are meant to, to play and to help uh, people behave better, but basically this perspective about the, the human animal is for itself um, influencing the construction of reality, meaning that it may be true that all of these uh, kind of mechanisms and barriers and this blind spots and, and problems <laughs> of our thinking, uh, they really explain a lot of our behavior. But uh, in a sense, part of our kind of being human and part of uh, our functioning and many aspects uh, and, and fields that influence our behavior are, are claiming opposite claims about uh, our being in reality and and moralities that speak about virtues and that speak about <coughs> relationality and that speak and and which speak about uh, uh, being able to you know to to express uh, what is like beyond self approaches to other are not only kind of side uh, theories but uh, in a, in a sense it seems like in a behavioral way you have to all all also have this kind of cultures and tradition to, to shape and structure and, and, and motivate the person that is this human uh, animal that you try to, you know, to, to educate in, in the lab or, or to study. So in, in that sense, it, it, fe it feels that dealing with humans as as, uh, as having all these kind of barriers is, is for itself uh, a social construction that may be problematic and that may be, that we may need to balance with, with other perspectives that are not less representing uh, reality, I think, because reality, is, at least in my perspective, is all about narrative and this cognitive so, uh, literature gives some kind of narrative about what is human that is not necessarily the ultimate one and eventually also has some problematic effects on, on our own uh, kind of self-regulation because I myself at least wouldn't like to think about myself as thinking only you know, the first kind of uh, first system and every person tries to develop this second uh, track and, and think uh, more deeply. And this brings me to our own uh, kind of research of the conflict resolution. In conflict resolution, the basic literature that found is the foundation for the field is about conflict as a consequence of barriers to settlement and barriers to conflict resolution. And it means that ex post, after people behave in certain ways and have conflicts, they are unable to get into an agreement because of a list of barriers that some of them relates to the rational behavior and are explained by more like economics and others and some of them, many of them, and the most important ones are explained by cognitive barriers such as the, the unique barriers that are related to conflict, the optimism, the loss aversion, the reactive evaluation and all. So a lot of this literature is built on this kind of idea of overcoming barriers and in a sense in, in conflict resolution, it is like opposite than the law. In the law, pursuing justice is part of what we do. This is why you come to court. In conflict resolution, pursuing justice is kind of an, an cognitive bias. And it's a, it's a self-serving uh, bias, self bias. And if you try to pursue for justice directly, you usually are just bounded in your self-interest. So you try to overcome it. So when we go to the settlement arena where the judge is 
And in my sense, I feel like the best way to deal with these barriers is, is after the fact, because I feel at least that to regulate it in advance, you always find that the nuance small case has its own kind of play. But let's say that both ways are good, and you, we, we both try to regulate it, but then after everything happened and all the barriers were, you know, were already operating on the people, they are in the courtroom. And then in the courtroom, let's assume that they suffer from all these kind of, self, of these bi bi biases that we, you discovered. So my questions would be, what, what, first of all, I mean, what makes people, I mean, we find that many cases settle before they get to the courtroom. So what makes people settle before they go to the courtroom with this kind of, is it kind of a reality check they have with the other side, kind of process that, you know, uh, the fact that they reveal all the documents and they have the, the, the discovery helps them to learn to have more information. But the most important question about judges is what is the role of judges in terms of trying to balance these kind of uh, barriers and, 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 and biases? And to what extent that you think that the settlement talk that happens in the courtroom is a kind of a, a, a mode that is capable to overcome them. In a sense, it is structured as a kind of a, a, a heuristic way to predict what will happen later, because it is a first stage. And it has all this problem of thinking, this uh, uh, first track uh, kind of thinking. But in a way, we also find that judges use many ways that try to give the parties a different kind of uh, incentive and a different kind of perspective about uh, what happens in the court. And uh, I wonder to, to what extent you, you think that the judges can use their abilities to help parties uh, deal like uh, with people with their conflicts, assuming that before that they had kind of various perspectives and, and they come to court with have diverse moral uh, stories about what they do. So I am just assuming that really reality is relativistic. Perceptions are subjective. Parties are in a conflict. Within the conflict, they suffer from various barriers. To what extent do you think that judges and you think that regulating what judges do in this, in this uh, stage can be helped by your, by, your, by your study? Is it something that you would find uh, interesting? Is it something that is too much uh, after the fact that you think that uh, can, can less work? But I mean, I'm really interested and, uh, and, uh, and I think that the, the, some of the interesting questions that emerge from your assumption about people's behavior is Assuming that they already are in a conflict, assuming that they already have some kind of infringement and some, some kind of right was, was not obeyed, to what extent this perspective of yours helped them get into a place where they, they, they get into an agreement and to what extent a third person with what he does uh, can help in, uh, in achieve, uh, getting to this point? So in, in our <coughs> observations, we found that many times judges do what uh, we call the settlement talk, speaking about uh, the importance of settlement, of how is it uh, uh, better than deciding. Sometimes they tell, jo tell jokes about uh, how bad is it to decide. Sometimes they give the parties this weakness and strength and, and get each party to see what is the you know perspective of the other in terms of even the moral uh, uh, perspective? Sometimes they differentiate and they say we wouldn't give you this moral uh, catharsis that you're expecting. We are here just to settle this case based on law, and law is here, and the conflict is there. So they have this technique of of separating. So this kind of of uh, work that, that, that we see that many times intuitively tries to bring people from one position of having a diverse perspective 
to a perspective in which they're capable of walking out of the room with an agreement. I mean, what do you, what do you think, what is their role to, to, to this kind of cognitive psychology and moral behavioral uh, uh, cognitive psychology uh, perspective to, to, help, to help them uh, work? So this would be a big question. I know it's not, uh, not it can't be maybe answered, but uh, I think uh, at least for, for us, uh, this uh, kind of magic or interest is, is what happens that, that creates this change, change of mind that, that, that sometimes happens in, in the court or during the track of the fight. So you want to, maybe other questions and then you ask? Um, yeah. Maybe I'll answer you okay. just uh, uh, <laughs> one or two minutes. Um, so yeah, I think it's, uh, thank you for all the comments. I think, uh, first of all, for judges to do that, they need to know a lot about this literature. So I, I think uh, there is uh, George Lewinstein, again, one of the most important uh, psychologists from CMU. He argues that this whole idea of the law of good people, not, not the law, sorry, this is the, the good people literature, uh, is very problematic because it's, in a sense, take responsibility from people because they figure, oh, it's no, the situation is not me. Actually, in, in, a, in kind of, I think, the uh, um, in a sense, almost the opposing view from, from Lewinstein, I think that if courts were able to convince people that much of their own feeling, first of all, are inaccurate about themselves, are inaccurate, that many of the things that they were, you know, uh, someone is, is uh, suing them for or accused of, are not the, the product of their own deliberate decision, but it's rather could happen to many people in that situation, might, be, might help people, um, in a sense, be more kind of genuine in reflection about their behavior. So I think what, what, I think what happens sometimes in court, people already, when they come to court, they rehearse their kind of explanation for their position so many times, they're unlikely to change it in court. But if you somehow engage in some process where people could, uh, right, okay, you did that, you, this is, we believe you, this is what we think, and actually there's a lot of literature that suggests, so it's not the suggestion that you could think that and still be mistaken. So it's not that you are a liar, people are very, become very defensive if you think they lied. But if you, you tell them, you know, there are various biases which could have caused you to feel that you were entitled to do what you did and you didn't actually uh, feel about yourself as, as being as bad, I think this, even this process could kind of free people from the need to defend what they did. Uh, and I think maybe in this, such a process they could use this, uh, um, you know, either this kind of a third party or the, the, the judge or the mediator or whoever who kind of look at the situation and tries to help them recognize their own wrongdoing in, in a different way uh, might, you know, kind of free the defensiveness, which I think harms their ability to take responsibility of what they did. Um, so maybe this is an, a way to kind of use this literature to help judges become more effective in helping people become more kind of authentic about their own wrongdoing. Yeah, I'm sure. Maybe it will be patronizing, I hope. I mean, if, I guess if it, it, maybe a judge can he say that, can he just uh, give them some reading and say, listen, you may think that you may be bad. No, I mean, yeah, it's a... May, I mean, it's it seems to be more really kind of a mediator. Mediator, I think. But it could be, be also. Yeah. But it could be an interesting explanation for why we see less of what we call broad JCR, which is more the mediation. What, what was that? So we have this uh, understanding or a typology that we're creating where we're describing judicial behavior along a continuum where you have broad JCR or judicial conflict resolution practices that are more the softer skills and more akin to mediation, and then narrow JCR, which is more kind of a nudging decision-making by thinking about the cost and risk and uh, uh, really appealing more to loss aversion, I think, and to rational choice than anything else. And maybe this is a good explanation for why we see more of that, because when you talk to judges, you hear more of the broad JCR mental disposition of judges. They want to make, you know, they want to help people resolve their problems in a richer fashion, but then Given what you're saying, it's not really realistic to be able to do that in the courtroom. So you kind of have to change a system and change uh, the, the narrative from 
you know, the positions and resolving the real conflict that, that you've prepared at home and so forth, and kind of use a whole different set of decision-making rules, the narrow JCR sort of practices, because that, that is what can work in that uh, situation in the courtroom. And that's maybe a good explanation for why we, you know, when, when judges talk, they talk more the broader talk, but when they have to get parties to agree to something, that doesn't work for them in the courtroom. Something mm -hmm. else I, has to work. It, it may be part of the failures of interviews, as Gideon said before. That was judges are saying right. that they want to do. <laughs> it may be that they, they need to think that they are able or that it's, it's, more, it's more ethical to do the, broad, the broader uh, JCR. But if you ask them uh, what other judges do, they would describe the narrow JCR. So right. it's not the same explanation as, uh, as right. you draw from, from Yuval. People tend to speak more free when they speak about others, mm -hmm. other than themselves. But then they bring themselves into the others. Well, may, may I ask you, please? I was wondering when you were talking about uh, cultures. Uh, and I, I just recall when I arrived at the University of Cambridge in England, I was shocked to see all the policemen walking around without guns. Nobody has a pistol. So I, I asked these Brits, how come policemen are walking around without a pistol? And I said, well, it's very simple. The, the criminals are without a pistol themselves. So wow, <laughs> sounds makes a lot of sense. So how come in Israel we cannot have the same rule? Policemen would be without pistols, and then the criminals would have, would be, it's amazing. Then I thought to myself, what if British criminal comes to Israel? Or to the States. But that's a fact that British criminals do not have pistols. So how do they, how do they become, how do they? <laughs> well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's commit crime. Become, become Maybe in Cambridge. <laughs> professor, <laughs> professor of criminal law. So please Spain. give me your money. <laughs> professor, <laughs> a, a, a professor of criminal law explained this to me that it, it, it's a common knowledge that that's what, that's, okay. Then, 20 years later, uh, my lovely wife Daphna and our five children, uh, we are going to the Netherlands, and uh, there is a, a lovely park. And if, when you go in the morning, the, if you take a, a, a milk or a loaf of bread, you just happen to, you are supposed to leave a few euros there. Everybody's doing it. Then I thought to myself, what if this park would be in Israel? <laughs> would actually people honor the system and just leave the same amount of money that is expected? And it brings me to the question of, uh, is it? Is it just my intuition, or there is actually empirical study of the behavioral, the, the legal behavior of, of people when they change atmosphere, when they go to another country? So if, if from, in my research, if business people and lawyers have to come to a decision of going to the arbitration or alternatively to court, and then you take this Israeli guy, you move, you move him, whether it's a businessman or lawyer, move him to another country, would he adapt easily to the culture or, or it's a DNA. Right. Um, wow, well, this is something you could approach from so many directions, but I think just maybe one for the lack of time will be this idea of conditional cooperators. So I think the majority of the population in many kind of games are conditional cooperators. So they will cooperate if you think the other person will cooperate. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of you know kind of more kind of econ perspective on culture. So people will stay in line. They will not you know do anything if they think all everyone else. If they think others might cross them, they will cross. So you know there is a lot of uh, and I, I I talk to my students a lot over the years about that. And I think like you see that you know we Israelis have a very low esteem about Israelis. <laughs> and I think they kind of think that. Uh, and maybe some of it is true, but at the end, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, and we are kind of in a equilibrium where, you know, I'm asked, sometimes asking my students, how many of you will put a note if you hit a, you know, you bump into a parking lot and you hit a car, how many of you? And the common reaction that, you know, the chance that everyone would give me a note if they had hit my car, this is what prevents them from putting the note. I mean, and, and so the good question, what will happen if those Israelis will be in a parking lot in, in the Netherlands or in Zurich or whatever, would they put a note or they will only behave better in a place where they are kind of monitored. So they will stay in line 
uh, when they go to Euro Disney because you know they think this is the way to behave, but in their kind of own private behavior, they will still keep up with the norms. And I think like in recycling, you see sometimes that if it's private behavior, people will keep up with their values. If it's more public, they will you know try to kind of fit in. It's critical. Yeah. It um, comes to critical mass. Right. One question I had when related to our next meeting is about. Uh, Emotions. I mean, maybe in regulation it doesn't work so much, but in conflict resolution, there is today a, a lot of I mean, some critical literatures that says that the emphasis on cognitive ba barriers and strategic barriers over the years was neglecting the important data we have today about emotions and their roles in conflict and in perception in general. So, to what extent do you think that? emotions or emotional barriers and all kind of expression are relevant, at least in the context that we have of, of conflict. I think uh, this is uh, like from uh, many, many, like uh, I remember even when I started to work on law and psychology, was kind of my first kind of uh, impression of the literature, how come no one speaks about emotions? Um, and I have to say, from time to time, I keep saying it. How come no one speaks about emotion? But I never did. Uh, and fewer people did focus on emotion. And there are some good reasons why uh, the literature on emotion is such, it's based in psychology, is such that it's hard to build a policy based on it. So there is a, a Jennifer Lerner. Uh, so I work under her and in her lab uh, when I was in, in, in Harvard. So she she's... Uh, I think she's working on a book on emotion and public policy, and and, and so when she, when she speaks that people don't you know pay enough attention to emotion has some credibility because she did most most of her research is about uh, uh, emotions and like and there there are extremely interesting findings with regard to emotions that for example reversed many of the findings of the first skin karma. If you kind of manipulate anger, people will you know the risk. So many important things change. If people are angry, and, and this is fascinating stuff. I was uh, many, uh, uh, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm that old, but in many kind of uh, kind of situation that I was, thought, I have to work on emotions, uh, and I think it's it's a huge literature and psychology completely almost ignored, and I'm sure it <coughs> it has dramatic effects. Uh, it just, um, I mean, somehow. I, Many conferences, they always say, you know, why would no one is speaking about emotion? But this is what you always hear, like people complaining. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Yuval, our next meeting is with Professor Ran Alperin uh, oh, yeah, from he's, IDC he's, yeah. about emotions and conflict resolution. So you are very much invited, and everybody is invited because we do think that it's a challenge. But thank you so much for your presentation. because I'm not going to be in the next uh, meeting that I wrote about emotions in my PhD. <laughs> and I found that mediators, mediators in Israel, they use emotions yeah. when they are stuck. <laughs> when they come to dead end, they move from uh, facts and law to emotions, and they use emotions. That Judge Heshin from the Supreme Court, the late Judge Heshin would have concurred with you, would have agreed. Well, he, he always said that when he had, uh, we didn't know exactly how to tackle it, you will start writing about his emotions and other emotions. Oh, really? Please, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. So then.